The Panama Canal is in trouble. After a century of being the most efficient way to get between the Pacific and the Atlantic, its small size and increasingly long wait times are causing people to lose faith in the U.S. construction and instead seek solutions elsewhere. Most notably, China is looking to pounce on the opportunity to seize more influence in South America by building a new canal in Nicaragua. Mexico is trying to build the interoceanic corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and several South American countries are banding together to create the Bi-Oceanic Corridor. But why the heck do all these countries care so much about connecting these two oceans anyways? In 1913, if you wanted to get from New York to somewhere in California, you would need to take a trip all the way down and around South America and back up. This would take about 13,000 miles, but only a couple of years later, it would only take half that time due to the creation of the Panama Canal. In the 1500s, explorers like Vasco Nunez de Balboa discovered that Panama was a narrow strip of land separating the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. This sparked the idea of creating a waterway through Panama to link these two oceans, offering a shortcut for trade and travel between Europe and Eastern Asia. A lack of suitable technology and infrastructure to complete the project resulted in it remaining a pipe dream for the time being. However, the allure of a direct waterway across Panama persisted, and in the 19th century, serious proposals began to emerge. During this time, the American government decided to finally move forward with creating a canal and solving the supply route inconvenience they'd been dealing with for seemingly forever. For centuries, there were three places that had to become primary overland transport points for ship cargo. Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Mexico, the narrow stretches of land in Nicaragua, and of course, Panama. After decades of discussing a project without actually starting one, the United States Senate was offered a proposal of making a canal in either Nicaragua or Panama. For the longest time, Nicaragua was actually the preferred location. It was lower in elevation, which meant that the need to raise and lower ships as it traveled through the canal wouldn't be as high. They also believed that many of the dangerous diseases that were found in the Panamanian forests wouldn't be present. With all that being said, the United States still ended up going with Panama, and the primary reason for this begins with Frenchman Ferdinand de Lesseps. Ferdinand de Lesseps, although not formally trained as an engineer or architect, rose to prominence as a visionary entrepreneur and fervent nationalist. His pivotal role in successful construction of the Suez Canal in Egypt fueled an ambition for another monumental canal project, this time in Panama. However, de Lesseps' grand vision for Panama was muddled by the harsh realities of the region's challenging geography, which he underestimated in his pursuit for another achievement. As expected, the French efforts in Panama faced immense difficulties from the onset. Mudslides, a consequence of torrential tropical rains, effectively erased excavation progress as fast as it was made. There was also the issue of needing to somehow excavate a sea-level canal through mountainous terrain, a task that any engineers would tell you was insurmountable. Compounding these challenges were the deadly tropical diseases in the region, particularly yellow fever and malaria. These diseases ravaged the workforce, leading to significant loss of life and dire health conditions among workers. There is even a story that came from the period, possibly untrue, but reflective of the project's circumstances, of a French chief engineer arriving in Panama with his own coffin. Upon the French's eventual failure, the United States pivoted from Nicaragua to Panama due to the groundwork laid by the French and the availability of infrastructure at discounted prices. The American endeavor in Panama faced its own set of obstacles, but key figures like Chief Engineer John Stevens and Chief Sanitary Officer William Gorgas played pivotal roles in overcoming challenges. Stevens' organizational prowess and adoption of a locked canal system suitable for Panama's conditions, along with Gorgas' successful efforts to control tropical diseases, were instrumental in the eventual success of the Panama Canal project. The Panama Canal has been up and running since 1914. For the time, it was exactly what was needed to improve the efficiency of sea travel. Even today, it is still used and is still the most efficient way of getting from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean if traveling by sea. 
However, as time passed, more and more issues with the way it was constructed have begun showing up. The first being it is now way too small. Many modern cargo ships are much too wide and or much too big to fit through the canal. The Panama Canal was not made with the intention that ships would increase that much in size. And even with recent expansions made in order to remedy this, the largest of ships are still unable to travel through the canal. This doesn't even mention that if the canal was wide enough, it would likely be too shallow to fit the larger cargo ships anyway. Another issue with the canal in modern times is that it's just too crowded. It can take upwards of 10 plus hours for ships to make it through. With how much more work it takes to go all the way around, plus the massive increase in imports and exports over the last 100 years, it has resulted in the Panama Canal being seriously backed up. It has only increased the one for an alternative route between the Pacific and Atlantic. So what are the other options? If the Panama Canal is no longer cutting it, why not circle back and create the canal that was the favorable option anyway? Well, the simple answer is they tried. In fact, several countries tried, including the United States. Despite having picked Panama, the United States had promised Nicaragua that they would make them a canal, as it would be incredibly profitable for the country and would improve relations between them. Initially, they would attempt to stick to this promise. However, the 1929 stock market crash and Great Depression, followed shortly after by World War II, would result in a complete cease of work on the project by the U.S., it wasn't until 2006 where the Nicaraguan government had once again expressed interest in opening a rival canal to Panama. This now desperation from the Nicaraguan government would lead them to make a deal with a country that seemed to have ulterior motives. Negotiations would be had between the Nicaraguan government and Chinese construction company HKND. And in 2012, Nicaragua gave HKND a 50-year concession to build the canal and operate it with the potential to be extended for another 50 years afterward, essentially providing a Chinese company and by proxy the Chinese government control over a major trade route in the Americas for a minimum of 50 years. Details of this deal that was made were also revealed to be increasingly shady in that the deal didn't really have many details at all. The project itself rested somewhere around the $40 billion mark, and well, HKND was fronted by an incredibly rich Chinese billionaire, Wang Ying, who claimed he had found all the investors required to complete the canal in just five years. HKND didn't provide any information on exactly how they planned to fund the project. They also didn't specify an exact route for the project either, which was a bit strange. Beyond that, the wording of the contract itself seemed to also provide HKND with power to avoid making payments to Nicaragua, allow them to delay making the canal and instead work on other loosely relevant projects that could be profitable to themselves free of any tax. Despite growing concerns from the international community, a re-proposal was made by HKND that would provide a bit more detail of just how they planned to execute the project. However, this did not quiet the criticism. Many logistical concerns were raised as the time frame of five years seemed wildly inaccurate, and the equipment and fuel requirements for the project were not even currently located in Nicaragua, nor did it seem practical to supply or operate such equipment given the frequent rain found along the projected route. Oh yeah, and who can forget the active volcano known as Concepcion found dangerously close to where the ships would travel. Beyond the troubles with construction, there were also major environmental concerns as the route would require ships to travel through Lake Nicaragua, which is the largest freshwater source in all of Central America. And well, mixing the saltwater Pacific with the freshwater would be bad enough. How could it get any worse for the prospects of a Nicaraguan canal? Well, it turns out it could get worse. As in 2016, just a few years after the deal had been finalized between HKND and Nicaragua, the Chinese stock market crashed, resulting in Wang Ying losing 85% of his net worth, and shortly after, HKND would go out of business, closing their office in China and disappearing without leaving Nicaragua any means of contacting them. All right, so the attempts were made at another canal, and unfortunately for Nicaragua, 
or perhaps fortunately, given the terms of the deal, it all fell apart yet again. Surely there must be some other options to help remedy the situation. The Inter-Oceanic Corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec offers a different solution compared to previous attempts at creating new canals or projects. Mexico has chosen to revitalize an old railway line that has been in existence for over a century, directly connecting the Pacific and Atlantic. The Mexican government aims to refurbish the old lines and introduce new ones, revitalizing what was once a vital part of the inland route between the two oceans long before the Panama Canal was constructed. The railway's decline in popularity and economic impact stem from a civil war in the area, coinciding with the completion of the Panama Canal by the United States. The canal provided a safer and more efficient shipping option, leading to a rapid decline of over 75% in rail cargo within two years. The railway became obsolete in the face of such a competitive and efficient alternative. In 2020, Mexico's president proposed an alternative approach that doesn't compete with the Panama Canal, but provides a supplementary option due to the canal's increased congestion and challenges in recent years. The proposal includes upgrading transportation infrastructure like railways, highways, and airports, enhancing connectivity between ports on both coasts, improving maritime logistics, and reducing transit times and costs. The CIIT project is progressing well, and its impact on global trade remains to be seen. However, it raises the question of whether other regions are considering similar strategies to diversify and optimize transportation options between oceans. On December 21, 2015, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay jointly signed the Asuncion Declaration to kickstart the Bioceanic Corridor project. This initiative focuses on upgrading major roads, bridges, railways, and tunnels connecting these countries. It also aims to simplify travel and trade between Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. The main objectives are to make cross-border transportation faster and more efficient, enhance economic competitiveness among the involved nations, and foster closer regional integration through improved customs, procedures, and infrastructure. Geographically, South America's natural barriers, like the Andes Mountains and the Amazon Rainforest, have historically hindered internal trade, favoring routes like the Panama Canal for east-west trade. This dynamic, coupled with historical ties to outside powers like the United States, has shaped South America's trade patterns. The Corridor Project aims to change this by connecting Brazil's interior to Chilean ports via Paraguay, cutting travel time significantly. This could mean increased exports for Brazil, especially in agriculture and better access to Asian markets for Argentina's beef and wheat. Chile stands to gain as a regional trade hub with its established port infrastructure and trade agreements. However, critics point out several challenges and potential downsides, particularly regarding China's involvement. China's economic influence in South America has grown significantly, with investments in infrastructure projects, mining operations, and renewable energy projects. This has raised concerns about Chinese economic dominance in the region and its potential geopolitical implications. That is two of the projects that have been heavily influenced by China. What are their plans for these relationships, and what are the geopolitical implications for the United States and the Panama Canal? For the United States, China's expanding presence in South America presents challenges. It could weaken U.S. influence in the region, historically considered its backyard, and affect trade dynamics, especially if Chinese investments lead to increased exports to Asia instead of the United States. This shift could impact U.S. businesses and trade relations in the region. Furthermore, the development has the potential to impact the Panama Canal's role as a key trade route. While the Panama Canal has long been a vital link for global trade, offering a shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the new corridor could offer an alternative route for some shipments, especially those originating from Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Chile destined for Asia. This competition could lead to adjustments in pricing, services, and infrastructure development at the Panama Canal to maintain its competitiveness. Additionally, increased connectivity in South America may encourage more intra-regional trade, affecting the types and volumes of goods passing through the Panama Canal. 
the HKND project in Nicaragua fell apart. But unfortunately for the United States, the corridor is actually about 75% completed. And because of an aloofness of the U.S. government, most of which has been completed via help from the Chinese without much pushback, the U.S. and its Panama Canal will have to face these consequences of not being the only option in the region anymore. Bye for now.